Well, six oh five. I guess we can uh, get started with who we've got in here. Um, I sent you a few few things. I think the first uh, easiest thing to talk about is uh, just what is a demo recording, and um, this it's got kind of a weird name if you think about it, especially nowadays, because uh, the original concept of the demo recording is is almost the same as just recording now. Because if you you know, if you're going to be a DIY home artist, that's then you're just doing the recording. You know, it's, you kind of skip that step a lot of times. Um, but yeah. even in, even in those situations, sometimes I think uh, the concept of a demo recording can still be a healthy thing for, you know, developing artists to, to do. So what do you, what do you what would you say a demo recording is in its core? I mean, usually it's the first time you you record a song or that you're working a song out. You know, um, like you talked about the recording process. If you're planning on going into a studio like mine, you're going to spend a lot of money per hour. You know, it's not a lot of money, but you're spending money per hour to be there. So it's very important that you've done your work at home. You've, you've recorded the song. You know how it goes. So when you go into my studio, you don't waste a bunch of time. So I think that's the most important thing because when you're playing the song, you can't really listen to it. You know, if you're singing, especially if you're singing, you don't really know what you sound like until you hear it back. So doing a demo recording is a really great way uh, to hear yourself back and see if these parts are working. Mm. And then also it, it's supposed to be kind of no stress. Like sometimes in the studio, you have the recording light on and you're like, oh, this is and the one. Go. <laughs> yeah. Demos are usually like kind of at home and it's midnight and you feel inspired or it's 6 a.m. and you're in spot, whatever, you know, you're just kind of uh, recording when inspiration hits. So demo recordings can be just your iPhone and your voice apps. Mm -hmm. You know, you might just have an idea and you're like, turn it on and you, you sing it or you play it or you tap it on a wall and that's the demo because that's when you go to your bandmates and you're like, mm -hmm. here's the song I got and everyone listens to it. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I got it. And then they expand upon it, you know? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, and, and even, even for other instrumentalists, like if you, if you're a drummer and you hear how that fill is landing and you suddenly realize that it's not really together with the rest of the band, even though it feels right when you're in the moment, like, even if you've gone through the song a bunch of times, it's just that feel feels right, feels fine, but then you hear it outside of yourself playing it, and then suddenly you realize like, that really is not working, you know? Or if you're a bass player, you start to notice where the kick is happening and where you are not happening, and, and, and you can just see that from an outside perspective, and less about like what you're feeling in the moment as you play it, and, and uh, just kind of a little bit more subjective, you know? To, or objective, totally. and, and objective i guess i should say objective yeah you're listening to it rather than like struggling to play it and then think maybe you hit it or not but mm -hmm. and it always seems like you know i'll be working with the band and like right after the first chorus or, or going into the bridge there's like a stumble every single time they, they play it so then mm -hmm. i'll get on the talk back and i'm like hey guys uh, what's happening coming mm -hmm. out of that chorus it seems like it's stumbling and then everybody will kind of look at each other and go yeah, what is happening there? I've never figured it out. It's like, that's, you know, because it live, that probably went by just fine. Nobody yeah. really paid attention to it. It was literally a half a second. But on the recording, it's like, oh, that, that sticks out like a sore thumb that nobody knew what note is supposed to be played right there or what the rhythm is. Mm -hmm. So it, that would be another reason to do. But even when people do demos, then they don't critically listen to it. I mean, that that, that goes to then you bring it to me who's a producer mm. and I listen to it and I point, help point those things out and help you fix those things before we go into the studio. So yeah. that's what the demo is also for me mm -hmm. and for, for the band, you know, it's kind of for everyone that you want to share your idea with. That's a good, and that's another good point. And, you know, in the context of this program, we have the mentors, which um, are that producer role, that sort of critical ear yeah. to, to be like, you know, that, Phil, I don't know, man. There's something, there's something <laughs> sticking out weird about the way you're hitting that 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 uh, symbol coming out, or you know that bass bass line is just uh, doing some weird notes that's not really in the scale, or I don't know, you know, and just yeah. kind of start asking those questions and start trying to like problem solve through what what the dilemma is in that part, and that's honestly like you know, <laughs> demo recording can be really fun in the beginning, like especially like you said 
6 a.m. You're really inspired. You just throw your phone down and you start going. And it can get really tedious when you start to realize like how much work it is to really get a full band recording sounding tight and, you know, together and everyone's doing parts that make sense yeah. together and all that stuff. But that, I mean, that's really the work of being a musician. That's where it really where starts is in that demo process. You know, it's not, yeah, it's, it's paying not in attention the studio. to those details. Yeah. yeah it's not, before you get to the studio, <laughs> before you get to the studio, because by the time you get there, it's going to be the most stressful day you've ever had. If you haven't worked out that stuff yeah. all the time, because then the producer or even the engineer, a lot of times who's, you know, a lot the if it's just being engineered, they'll still have an ear for it. And they'll still be like, are you sure that's what you want to do there? Right. <laughs> you know? Well, but, even uh, just having the band write down the structure of the song, mm. you know, like people don't even do that. And that, that was something in college that we always had to do is like, you picked all these famous songs that everyone's heard of, but you had to go write down all the parts, you know? Mm -hmm. And then that really like gets your mind thinking in a different way about the song. It helps you learn the song quicker. And it also learns like if you and this guy, if, if we're in a band together, you might call it a section the A section and I call it the verse. Mm. And the guitar player calls it the, oh, A, or, you know, the B part. The first and you're riff. like, B? <laughs> and he's like, no, well, because I'm playing B the whole time. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and the singer calls it a verse because he's singing a verse and the drummer calls it, uh, you know, uh, whatever. It's like, so you have Third to movement. realize like, <laughs> we're all talking a different language. So let's get our language in line so we can explain really quickly. When I say go to the B part, it's not the second part. It's where we're playing B, <laughs> you know? So yeah. It's like that kind of communication, I think really helps. And that comes out in the demo process as well. Yeah. Cause you have to like talk about those parts at, in the locations that they are and refer to them in whatever totally. language you know as a musician and, and what if you go into the studio and the producer goes hey that second verse i think it should be half as long we don't have a now second do, verse <laughs> yeah now do i have to like go oh second verse oh c section oh that's our d, third uh, chorus <laughs> no get, let's all talk the same language you yeah. know then you know like oh yeah second verse is the c part because i'm playing c you know whatever this has nothing to do with anything but this reminds me of the story i was working with a ukrainian violinist who is like a concert violinist uh, and uh, orchestra does not have that kind of language. They don't do verses, they do movements and things like that. Right. So, so we're in the studio and he's like, it took me a minute to know what part you're talking about because in orchestra, we have no bridges. There's no bridge. We don't do any bridges. <laughs> we just play the next part of the song or the right. piece, you know, it's a piece. It's not a song. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's the same thing, right? It's like, uh, you know, that communication is super important. You know, in a band to, and it's, the, it's not even universal really it's it's whatever works for your band and whatever you can yeah you can parts. call the section whatever you want as long as everybody knows what it is so yeah that gives you that flexibility to be like oh should we go back to the d section yeah let's try it because everyone knows what the d section is now mm. <laughs> you know it's like, right yeah. let's do that break over again what break oh yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah because maybe the drummer is actually breaking but the guitarist never stops or the guitarist is breaking in a section and the drummer never stops so <laughs> the break is different for different people it's crazy so we get through all the all the uh, first bits of of doing a demo and all the work and stuff like that and we'll get back into some of the methods of doing that um, but what is what can a band use a demo recording for like what are some of the uses uh, for having one um, even if you're not planning to go into a studio quite yet, or, or I mean, that's, I guess that's as part of it, but what are some of the other ways you can use a demo recording that you think? Well, it's just, it helps you remember the song, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're capturing that, that spark, that moment um, <clears throat> that you might forget about if, if you didn't capture it. And then, so, I mean, other than, yeah, the things we talked about preparing for the studio or sharing it with, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I guess there's kind of different levels of demos. Mm-hmm. Because there's also songwriters mm -hmm. that don't want to be in a band. They want to write songs for other bands. And so the demos that I make with them are in my studio with session musicians and they sound fantastic, you know? And you're like, that, that more sounds more like a finished product. And it's like, well, yeah, because they're trying to sell this song to have mm -hmm. somebody else go do it, you know? So 
that's like the highest level of demo. And then you'd have all the way down to the iPhone where I just need to remember this, or I just want to send this to my drummer real quick or my bass mm -hmm. player or, or the celloist, you know, whatever you need that, whenever you need to, to uh, share the idea with somebody. Right. Is, is basically. Another thing I think you can use them for is, um, you know, we talked about earlier sharing with a producer, um, but like getting a producer on board, if the yeah. producer can have some kind of idea of what it is you're going for, what it, what it is you're trying to do. And cause you know, not every producer is created equal. Not every producer is good for every single band. You want to make sure that the producer knows what they're getting themselves into and that, you know, you, that sort of uh, communication of that part gets said right away. So the producer can be like, I've done bands like this. I think I could really, you know, help you with this, this, and this, and this. And mm -hmm. having that, having that demo recording to, uh, to share them with them, you know, besides something on an iPhone, I think, at that point, you want something maybe a little tracked out um, just to kind of get the, the overall idea of the, of the project that can be really helpful too. All oh, right. Absolutely. What's but I, I don't mind like the crappier the demo is, the, the easier <laughs> my job is, you know. Sometimes <laughs> the demo, if it's too good and if the, if the person, the artist has spent too much time on it, they're so in love with it. Oh, it's true. You know, and then it's like they come into me and I want to make some changes and they just can't. Some people are, are fine and can make some changes and some people are just so tied to stuff. And it's like, well, you're paying me to listen to it and I don't, I think it could be better. So how are you going to get someone else to pay you to listen to it on mm. Spotify or something, mm. you know? Right. So I better be jumping up and down about it. Right. That's a good point. <laughs> you know, and that's, this uh, kind of brings up another point just about producers in general and, and um, when you do that demo recording, if you plan to work with a producer, try to keep an open mind, you know, um, and don't, don't let that get too set in stone. Cause when, cause what, like what, what you just said can happen where you sort of uh, cut yourself off from the song getting to that level where it could get otherwise. Uh -huh. And um, it's real easy to do. And I was just talking to somebody yesterday about that, that concept of, um, you know, letting the producer challenge you in ways and, and letting the song sort of, breathe in ways that you maybe hadn't thought of before and, and uh, stuff like that. And that you're absolutely right. Like it, it can get yeah. uh, in that demo recording process, you can shoot yourself in the foot by getting too in love with certain things um, or you're, or too involved with certain parts of it, especially depending on what the plan is, you know? Um, yeah, totally. Well, you have to have an open mind going into it. And um, those are, it's funny. I'll, I'll work with so many bands that bring in five songs but there's one of them that they just, you know, really love. They're like, every time we play this song live, it's just like people go nuts. And, and I'll, I'll know why, because it's like the simplest song that they have, you know, I'm like, <laughs> that's why they go nuts because people live, they hear the first chorus and already by the second chorus, they already know the song. So they're in it, mm. you know, but on an album, those songs are kind of like almost throwaway songs. The songs that you have to listen to five, 10, 20, 30, 150, 2000 times, those songs are the ones that are gonna become classics, right? Mm. So it's like, they'll hold these kind of cheap songs. I don't wanna say cheap, cause they might be formulated okay, but a very simple song. And, and they're like, it works live, it, we cannot touch it. And I'm like, but for the album, can we try? I just wanna try it. I don't have all the answers. Mm. I'm paid here to push you as the artist, you know? So we're going to break the song. We're going to put it back together. And some pieces are going to go back to the way they were. And some pieces are going to totally change. I have no idea what the outcome is going to be. This is an experiment, you know, mm -hmm. but if the band isn't on board to like go through that, then you're just kind of stalled and you're just going to be like, it's like the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. You know, <laughs> the theme this year for the live it out loud program is adaptability. And that definitely falls yeah. into that, that whole uh, concept where, um, if you're being presented with an option that is different than what you already have and you're unwilling to try it, that just means that you're unwilling to see what other options there are out there and you're limiting totally. yourself to the things that you've already decided are, are good. And as an artist, that is the worst thing you can do because exposing yeah. yourself to other methods and other ideas is the best thing you can do as an artist. It's what was going to grow you the most almost every single time I've done that, I've learned something completely new and a whole different perspective about music or, or even whatever it is I'm working on. Um, yeah. 
you know, there's, it's, it's such a, a great way to grow as an artist to let someone else like challenge you in ways that uh, are, might be uncomfortable or maybe you just hate, <laughs> you know, like instinctually you're like, I hate that idea. I yeah. hate it so much. I, that is the absolute opposite of what I would ever do in my entire life. Well, Let's it's try funny it. <laughs> that, yeah, it's, it's funny that somebody would rather argue why they're not going to try that for five minutes than just to try take it. 30 seconds and try it. Yeah, exactly. And, and we're giving you, you know, I'm giving you carte blanche to absolutely fail and stink it up really bad right now. And we're not going to hold it against you. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like we're, we all know that we're flying blind and we're trying something. So fail away and, and don't be scared, you know. It'd probably come up with something really cool that sounds like a anya parody song anya <laughs> fail away sail away fail, sail away. <laughs> so it's fail away uh, <laughs> i like it uh let's talk about the click track the infamous Ooh. infamous click track yes what is uh what is the <laughs> i'm gonna ask you this loaded question yes, got a robot what is so the right good. answer for the click track debate <laughs> i always go like this who plays drums in the band Whoever raises their hands, I go, do you play to a click? And if they go, yeah, then we use the click track. If they go, oh, I've never really tried it, but sure, we don't use a click track. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to go. <laughs> There's a simple answer. But, <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, the other part about it is, like, when, I, when I'm working with a band to create an album, you almost start backwards. So first you go, what kind of album do you want to make? And if they play me some super polished, you know, super on click track, edited drums, sampled drums with layered guitars, vocals, then of course, I mean, if they're drummer, oops, I lost Sky. Oh, I'm still here. Okay. Uh, if, they're, if their drummer can't play to a click track at that point, then I have to have an honest discussion with the band and say, either we have to get a new drummer for the session or we're not going to make that record that you guys want to make. Or if they're just a band and let's say they've been a band and they, they played, they just got off tour. They played every single night, you know, the last year and a half and they want to make a Ramones type recording. Then there's no way we could ever use a click track. <laughs> you know, so it's like you, every situation is going to be a little bit different. Right. But one thing in this new world, click tracks help with the shareability, mm -hmm. you know, and especially I was thinking about like with this program, with any band that's coming in the studio, we only have like two or three hours or something like that to record the song, right? Which is just a blink of a second in mm -hmm. a recording studio. So if we know the click track or the, the tempo to the song we're doing, then anybody who's recording right now on their songs at that tempo, is potentially a file that we can just slide right into our master session when you come in. So that's where a click track can, can save us so much time because it's just like so easy. I don't have to worry about where it lines up in the music. It's just like, boom, it clicks onto the click track and, and we can go. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's, it's going to be a stylized thing, you know, and some drummers like Matt Chamberlain, I've got to work with him a bunch, but he's, he's a guy who went to sleep with a click track on every night <laughs> and he would experiment with different tempos and seriously he slept to a click track every night wow and he he has to like he always he wants a click track on all the time and his playing is absolutely flawless you would never know he's playing to a click track until you zoom in on the grid and you just see like i've never seen somebody so perfect <laughs> but have so much feel wow. you know that's the guy that did all the tori amo stuff and um I mean, he's a session guy that's played on. If you looked up Matt Chamberlain, Google, oh, I've heard, I've, heard, I've heard of him for sure. Yeah, he's on everything. I mean, I think he was the first drummer in Pearl Jam, the mm -hmm. first or second. He did some of the demos, but that guy, it's just insane. But he's a freak of nature, you know. But I, I work with a lot of metal drummers and stuff too that really want the click. And the 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 other thing that a click can help with is fighting within the band. <laughs> Because when you don't use a click, it's like, oh, it's slowed down there. And then it's always the blame game. Like, who's slowing down and what's off and what's on? And the drummer wants to hear the hi-hat soloed with the, you know, the right guitar. And, the, you know, so it's mm -hmm. a lot more work where we're all sitting there just using our ears and, like, just trying to deduce, like, who's late, who's early, who's off, like, what's mm -hmm. going on. 
where when you have the click track, it's just like, who's off? You zoom in, you're like, oh, you're off. <laughs> and you fix it. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, that, there's a lot of really, uh, you know, good points about click track either way, right? Like, like you were saying, yeah. for, for those bands that have done that song, um, you know, a thousand times on tour and just want to come in and record it, like mm -hmm. if they've got the energy and it sounds good, just do it, you know, like yeah. don't, don't try to like lock them into something that they're not ready to, or that they really don't need to do, right? If it feels yeah. good. I mean, listen, to, there's some really great songs that obviously were not recorded with a click track. Like my favorite one is Carry On My Wayward Son. If you actually look at the tempo changes yeah. in that song, it swings like 20 BPM up and down. It's That's crazy, awesome. crazy. Yeah, yeah, but it sounds great. I mean, and, and, yeah. and like it gives, you can kind of hear it in like the first verse as it sort of speeds up a little, it kind of breathes <laughs> into that first verse. But I mean, this is a band that they probably played that song five or 600 times before they really recorded it. You know, yeah. they were, they and were they're very, all playing together and they were listening. Exactly. So they're like, oh, in the verse, let's quiet it up and slow it down a little bit. And then mm -hmm. we'll pick it up here. And, we'll, you know, yeah, that's and the journey. And it's very feel oriented. And they, you know, they, they really were paying attention to what they were doing. And I was, they probably had a lot of conversations about it too. Like it probably wasn't completely flying blind. I mean, changing tempos in a song is hardly a, uh, <laughs> a conversation that doesn't come up if it happens. You know, it's like, right. did we speed up there? You know, yeah. especially when you go to do the final recording. I mean, so, uh, some producer somewhere had to listen to that and go, you guys are slowing down like a lot right there. <laughs> Is that what yeah. you want? You know, and it sounds phenomenal, obviously. That it's was the 70s, good... though. Yeah, there's that, a lot of was, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Those guys then, are actually friends of mine. Are they really? Special. Yeah. That oh, drummer man. is rock solid, man. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, any, any tempo changes, he is absolutely in control of those. I don't That's know, maybe in the 70s, maybe he was under, you know, some <laughs> other things. But, <laughs> but. That's awesome. But, uh, but yeah, and then on the other side of that, like uh, having the ability to, like you said, like throw anything in in any order, um, yeah. move stuff around, like, um, you know, especially on, on time budgets, right? Um, mm -hmm. if, if you're a newer band and you haven't really recorded or played the song through that many times, you're still kind of getting your footing on the song um, and also kind of like just trying to figure out what the feel of the song should be. Cause you know, a tempo, uh, you know, a 130 tempo is going to have like a little bit more of an intense beat as opposed to like a 110 tempo. Right. So right. if the feel of the song is right at one of those, then it's easy to lock that in and just know that the song is going to feel a certain way at the end of the production rather than like yep. kind of leaving it to chance in a way. Um, yeah, I think the other thing is like you said, like, if the guitar player plays the first chorus flawlessly and then totally mm. botches the second chorus, boop, <laughs> yeah. done, and, done and done, right? You don't have to worry about it. And, and you know, like with, in the context of this program, like you said earlier, um, that's going to be awesome. You know, if you, if you know what yeah, the tempo is, time. saving lots and lots of time because there is very, very Because we used to time. fly stuff even back on two-inch tape into no-click tracks. Mm -hmm. I used to fly things. I had a four track digital recorder so I could take four tracks of vocals and like go to the second chorus and fly them in. But I would just do uh, like a sentence at a time. <laughs> so I just do the first sentence. You'd have to like play here and record on here, you know, get your timing just right. And then I go to my second sentence and I'd scroll up and get my digital recorder there so I could hit play and the second sentence came out. And That's so amazing. I used to do that and fly things all over the place. So I mean, it's still especially now in Pro Tools or whatever software you're using, it's like you can fly anything anywhere and make it line up with anything. It's just how much time do you want to spend doing that? Mm -hmm. And then what are the artifacts going to be from that digital editing? Mm -hmm. You know, did you have to just do two edits and it worked? Or did you have to do 300 edits and it mm -hmm. cross fades? And now it sounds like crap, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like when you have the artist right there, it's like lots of times it's easy just to have them replay it. <laughs> you know, it's easier right. than unless you are on that click and we're in a time budget. It's like, okay, psh, 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 don't, okay, done. Next, where are we going? Guitar solo? Right, you exactly. Know? Well, that's kind of the way that, I mean, like uh, for, for the students listening, that if you haven't been to London Bridge to record yet, it goes by way faster than you might think. Um, yeah. Because, you know, depending on how everybody records, if, you, if all the instrumentalists get into the room and the a vocalist is isolated, a lot of times somebody is going to mess up <laughs> somewhere. And so then it's like, you know, taking time to either redo that one part 
or break it down into ways, you know, and every band's a little bit different, but that time, you know, as you work through those problems, and by the way, this is every band too, by the way, this is not mm -hmm. just because you guys oh, yeah. are young, young bands. This is, this is like, you know, I, I did a, I did a song at London Bridge, actually, a number of years ago. We booked 10 hours for one song. <laughs> And, and that's still and we used all of it as a fact I oh yeah we, that's I like think, minimum yeah i think we went over by an hour i think we did 11 hours uh with john plum <laughs> that's awesome. and that's you know that's just you know, like you said that's kind of the minimum we could have done two yeah. days on that song yeah. just like making sure uh drums were perfect making sure the guitar tones were flawless the you know the way we played we you know we could have because we were sitting there with John Plum, who's also a great producer. He could have had some opinions on some of the vocal parts and guitar lines and things like that, that we could have tried some other stuff. In fact, I think we did, but you know, you never really have too much time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you don't, you never, you never think yeah. like, Oh man, I have way too much time in the studio. You always, you always feel like there's never enough. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Although back in the day, I mean, yeah, to put that in perspective, when I first started at the studio, we would spend three months recording a record. Those were the days. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we did have almost too much time. We would do like, we'd have one day to do a drum track and, you know, then the next day we'd do the bass for that drum track and we'd go golfing and then we'd come back and do <laughs> guitars and then go golfing. And uh, it was kind of interesting, but it was also just, I mean, you, you mentioned this word just a second ago, perfection. Mm like what is that and you know you have to realize that we're making art and there is no perfection in art the the, perf the perfect art is a logo <laughs> you know seriously like yep. mcdonald's might be the the m like is that the perfect art because it works everywhere it doesn't offend anybody and everybody knows what it is it's like that's the perfect piece of art but a van gogh or a, you know a Jimi hendrix or something it's like that does not work for everybody. Mm -hmm. That is not perfect. They have lots of flaws, mistakes, personality, all these things in it. And that's what great art is, <laughs> you know? So people get, especially now that people are their own producers and they have these computers sitting in front of them, they zoom in to everything mm -hmm. and they fix everything. Mm -hmm. Stop it. <laughs> that is the worst <laughs> number one way to ruin your music. Absolutely. Like, the flaws, the flows, those things are the things that make music timeless. Absolutely. Agreed. So you, you have to zoom out and see like the big picture. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. I, I am definitely guilty of that. I've, uh, I've sat in a studio for days at a time working on a guitar solo. And I ended up using like one of the early first ones I did, like after 87 right. takes and eight hours of literally 87 takes on this one guitar solo. That's awesome. Uh, I, I, listen to the final one. I'm like, okay, every note's in exactly the right spot. And it sounds yeah. really plasticky <laughs> and like, you know, kind of terrible. And uh, so I listened to like the third or fourth one. I'm like, oh, it's got some feel to it. A little, a little rough around the edges, but at least I met what I was doing, you know, like I, yeah. I was into it uh, as opposed That's, by the end, you know. So there's two things. Yeah. Two things that allowed that to happen. Number one, you had enough time to do 89 takes and then spend 10 hours of editing. Mm. And then number two, you have a growth mindset instead of you going, well, I spent 10 hours editing this. It's the right one. You mm -hmm. go, Oh wow. Shoot. Okay. And you were able to throw that away immediately and just use the right one. Yeah, and, that's and that's, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. You know, you should have the time and you should want to, try to do everything you can to make this the absolute best but checking yourself along the way and making sure you're not ruining it mm -hmm. is is just as important uh well i think we've we've covered a, quite a bit on just the concept of demo recording um we could talk a little bit about some of the specifics of how to do some basic demo recording especially for a band that um you know, maybe hasn't done it before or doesn't know how to do very much in the way of recording stuff. Um, I think this, obviously the simplest one we already talked about a little bit is just your phone. Um, yep. You can actually do that for your entire band. You can just, you know, the most phones have like a, just a real simple recording, like a, you know, note taking audio app built into it already. Most, I know iPhones do. 
and it sounds okay. And you know, it's, it can be a little bit distorted and sometimes, but at yeah. least it gets to the idea. And that's the very, 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 very basic thing that you want. If your band is like in the moment, it's midnight, you've been working all day on this tune and you just <laughs> need to remember it and all the changes that you made that night, uh, throw your phone out. I did this. I do this all the time. Yeah. It, you know, even, even though I do know how to record stuff, like it's sometimes just the, is the easiest way to, to get that idea done. Totally. Well, sometimes uh, it's good to limit your tools actually. Yeah. Because you might want to, you might get it down if you're recording into a computer, then, then all of a sudden you sit down and start editing it or working on it. And it's like, no, you just wanted to capture it really quick. So just capture it and know that you can't do anything else and, and go on with writing the next song or doing whatever, you know? Um, can I, can I put in some uh, input, uh, like a hey, Matthew. comment? Yeah, sure. Um, if you guys know the band Devo, they only had uh, about three members and they actually had to, they had a two track recording setup. And their, their philosophy was, if you didn't do it right the first time, get rid of it. You are not <laughs> passionate enough to get it right the first time. <laughs> yeah, so like they had, that was their mindset for a while, but then eventually they were like, okay, we're messing up way too much. So we now have to just get the right one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they would stay in their leaky, damp basement <laughs> until midnight getting one specific thing right in the song. There are a lot of crazy people in this field doing lots of crazy things to try to create something unique, you know, and Devo actually, you know, they are a testament to that. Like, no music sounded like them. And how were they able to make music that sounded like that? Pop music that got played on radios and stuff, you know? It's like... Yeah, uh, it's here's a fun fact. Their, one of their first songs, they had a guitar lick uh, on their song, Mechanical Man. It was made out of nothing but tritones. Mm. Yeah. Fun times. Craziness. Funny, <laughs> funny, fun tritones. Yeah, the devil's music. I would Actually, say... there's no evidence of that. There's no historical evidence of that, Sky. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Isn't all music the devil's music? No. Uh, according the... to Christians, yes. <laughs> all music is the devil's music, according to somebody. I think yeah. <laughs> depends on who you ask. Um, um, but I was going to say about iPhone recordings, especially if it's a band, put the phone right next to the singer. Yep. Or if there's a PA, put it like right in front of the PA because you will hear the drums, you will hear the guitars, you will hear the bass. You will never hear the vocals. Yep. So that's one thing that, that you can do to help make those turn out better. So um, say a band has like kind of a basic setup, maybe like a, uh, ooh, actually, this is a good, good opportunity for me to do this. Um, so me and Stephanie have been working on getting some basic like recording setups for you guys to be able to use. Uh, the computers that we ordered got canceled. So we have oh. one such setup, but um, it is uh, just a basic Dell. I got it right here. And uh, so this is a pack that it's going to be like a backpack that you guys can borrow and, and check out um, to use for this exact process, the demo recording process. And so it's, it's got the Dell, um, it's got a PreSonus two-channel um, I.O. input nice. thing. Yeah. Um, it has a PreSonus, get it out of the thing here, uh, microphone. What is it? The New M stuff. The M7. Whoa. Yeah. I want to hear that. Condenser microphone. Um, I tried cool. it out. It's actually not too bad, um, you know, because it came in the pack with the, with the PreSonus. Um, yeah. it's, it's a great starter microphone. Um, you can use it for a lot of things. And then a pretty nice set of headphones, actually, that comes in, in the, uh, the pack as well. Some full ear covering oh, yeah. yep. headphones. I'm going to try to put that back in the bag because it's all unfumbled. Uh, Do they get a mic stand? Oh, that's a good point. There is no <laughs> mic stand, um, but there is a five terabyte hard drive to store all your stuff on. Oh, cool. um, the pack is supposed to come with the Q2 uh, like stereo mic video recorder also. Oh. And uh, we have a SD card in the pack that you guys can use for that. Um, you can also use this SD card for any other camera because this is like the micro SD. Yep. So it goes into the little adapter 
and uh, you can use it for anything that's micro SD or regular SD. So if you have some other cameras at home, you can 128 gigs. So you can use that for that. So this pack is, uh, will be back at Ted Brown probably tomorrow or the next day if you guys need to use it. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, Jeff, if they have this pack with the two channels, uh, maybe they have their own mic, their own extra mic, and then they got that di you know, large diaphragm condenser mic. Uh -huh. What is a good way to do some demo recording with that setup? Like what's some good, good uh, ways to approach that? Well, there would be two different ways that the crummiest recording, but maybe just the funnest for, it, if a band is, is not too technical, they want it, they like the music, but they don't really want to be into the recording. I would say stick to either that, that video mic that you're talking about that has the recording in it, mm -hmm. um, or just do the mono, that one mic in the room. And the best thing to do would be to put it maybe closest to the singer or the PA record it for a couple seconds, listen back to it and just see like what it sounds like and maybe move the mic around, do a couple of those tests to where you find a good spot mm. and just capture it. And that's that first level of demo that we talked about. Right. If you're, there might be some people in here and they can chime in if they want that uh, maybe they've already used recording software or they're really interested in it and they want to, they can't wait to get to this pack and like figure out how to use it. Then I would say go for it and do that click track route and build it, you know? So maybe whoever knows the song the best, whether it's a guitar player or the singer or whatever, whoever can sing, sing or play the song from start to finish, just to a click track, have them go first. <laughs> and that's when writing the song down helps again, right? You can write it down on a blackboard and you know like, okay, it does the intro four times and we do a verse then six times and then we do, you know, whatever, you just write it out. And it may be um, so like, then, uh, sorry to interrupt, but it may be like yeah. during that process that you sort of go back and forth between recording and working on the song and recording and working on the song. Because as you, you know, as you try to do what you just suggested, play the song through in one go to the click track, you may find that there's parts of it that one person or another doesn't fully understand how that part goes. Yeah. And then it's kind of a problem solving at that point. Like, okay, I think it's supposed to do this. And um, it can be kind of a process to even just get that first little bit. But once you do, like you said, you can, you can start building. Yeah, then you just have the, the next people play on it and just go one by one because you got a nice pair of headphones and you got the one mic. So you can just even mic in the drums with one mic, you know, you can do it. Just once again, think about what the loudest thing is in the room. So when a band is playing, the vocalist is the quietest. So they need the most help with the microphone and the reinforcement. When you're thinking about a drum set, the cymbals are just going to kill you. They're the loudest thing. And the kick drum is like probably not going to come through. So maybe putting the mic down lower in front of it or, you know, at the drummer's head and then the drummer can sit there and kind of, you know, listen to be like what's louder, what's quieter and kind of even adjust their playing, you know, at a certain point. So um, just think about that and anything that you record, you can put the mic anywhere, but just first listen to it and maybe walk around it and just just think about what you're hearing. And when you find something that sounds good, then put a mic there. There's no right or wrong way to do it. You know, it's, you just want it to sound good. So if it sounds good, it's good. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just like on the, along the same lines, like uh, when we were at London Bridge, we probably spent like three hours miking up the drums. Yeah. And uh, maybe 45 minutes playing them. <laughs> you know like and that was just listening to the the tone moving the mic listening to it moving the mic listening to it moving the mic and that process is invaluable in getting a good good recording you know um, well, that's just, what makes you know like are you making a documentary where mm -hmm. a recording or a video just showed up and is like viewing what's going on in real life like what we're doing right now mm -hmm. or are you making like a michael bay blockbuster transformer movie you know that has right. all the special effects in it so that goes back to like, what's your end product again? Mm -hmm. And each of those are going to take different techniques and different amounts of time to accomplish. Exactly. Yeah. And, there, and, and, you know, if you're just trying to get the ID down, I think the iPhone is the way to go um, just to, to, to get started. Um, uh -huh. Just to make sure you kind of get something in there. Right. And then if you want just don't want the recording process to get in the way of right. exactly. writing, like right now, everyone needs to be working on the song and like making it as good as possible. So mm -hmm. not laboring on the recording and just getting it down so everyone can listen to it and play it to their mentors and play it to Sky and, and get some feedback. 
And then you can go back and re-record that demo like almost immediately, you know, right. and then get more feedback or listen to it and go, yeah, I know the, the old guys say that the chorus was too long, but no, we want it to be <laughs> is that length. And three that's minutes. the way it is. Yeah, I mean, that's, three minutes of chorus. <laughs> totally. That's, that's your prerogative. <laughs> But yeah, like, uh, you know, when you, when the, I think the, with the pack, especially, you know, in the context of this program, it's like a second step to your songwriting. Okay. Um, Sorry to bring up Devo again, but, uh, <laughs> but Devo has done that as well. Cool. Done what? They did, the, the extending the chorus during Jocko Homo. Sometimes oh. they would, <laughs> when they would play live, usually that song's about three minutes. Yeah. Yeah, there was a there was a song I used to do in my old band where um, we would we would keep the end chorus going until we felt like stopping the song or we we saw yeah. the crowd getting getting tired. That's absolutely a valid thing. Um, yeah, you know, except that's... they did it so much they would purposely make people angry. <laughs> that was their that was their whole thing. They tried to make loud, bad sounding music to make <laughs> yeah, sure great that people knew who they were. Yeah, that's, a, that's the way to go, man. Yeah, there's there's a there's a lot, you know, and, and we talked about this before. There's a lot to say about what's going to go on a record and what you do live. You know, there's the live yeah. experience and the record experience are almost nothing alike in in so many. Yeah, ways. I prefer them to be nothing alike. In fact, when I go see a band live and they're playing the click tracks and all these uh, prelays, I immediately walk out. That's the worst show I could <laughs> ever be personally. I would rather like, I was in a band called the Magical Unicorns. Mm -hmm. And since I own the studio, man, our, our band, I mean, we had horn sections, we had all this <laughs> stuff, we were a three piece. When we go play live, we just played the three of us. It was bass, right. drum, guitar, that's it. The, the songs were completely different. Right. But that's what I wanted. It's like, no, we're a three piece. And when we're in the studio, we can make the Michael Bay blockbusters, whatever we want. But when we go live, it's, this is just the real deal. It's us three and that's it. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally love that because when you go live, you want to see the artist playing, not just the songs, but you want to see their talent. Mm -hmm. And so when they stretch out a guitar solo or they, they add a break to a thing or they add a, they do a mashup, you know, they add a song into somewhere and then they go back to their song. Just any little fun things, I think, uh, is much more entertaining than just seeing them play the record, like start to finish. Done. Right. <laughs> Which I see bands do. And I'm just like, well could have stayed at home tonight <laughs> <laughs> awesome does anyone have any other questions for our illustrious guest tonight talking about demo recording and is process? anybody going to use that pack that's that's listening right now i think is some of the people in here talk? actually have some recording gear of their own okay i know uh, keegan does and i think jack does i have a four track there you go nice well, any questions on on using that for this project or anything? Do you guys plan on making any demos? Quiet bunch. Yeah. <laughs> um, Soaking actually, up. All hey, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, actually, before we do go to record at London Bridge, um, we should probably get a recording of whatever we're whatever song we're gonna do. Right? Is that a thing that we should do or? That's uh, the, so I'll, I'll let uh, Jeff answer that predominantly, but uh, the idea of a demo recording is preparing for, you know, like kind of practicing recording. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, well, I think that right now, um, that would be a great way to get the song to your mentor because is anybody, I'm, are you all getting together and playing as a band uh -huh. or what's, no? Uh, yeah, no, they, they uh, practice in, a variety of of socially distant settings <laughs> okay yeah so i would say that the demos are more for the band to learn the song and for them to get it to their mentors and and work out any changes before the studio and, um, and also if if there's you know if there's going to be a click track <laughs> just kind of having the drummer be able to uh know what that tempo is going to be and practice to it so that it's yeah. and, and the band itself too the band as a whole so like when you go in to record it's not like what tempo is this song i don't know you know, like you kind of have a better idea about at least that. Um, yeah. And uh, if you, you know, if your band knows the song really, really well, um, you, you may not need to bring in some of the demo recordings to work with. Um, but sometimes even having those on hand can be handy 
in the studio if you have like you know if the drummer's going to record by himself if you have the rest of the band already kind of demoed out and it's on a click track then he can play with those demo recordings um and yeah. you know the rest of the band doesn't have to necessarily play or if the singer's going to record later <laughs> if that singing track is demoed out you can the band can still kind of follow along where the song is and sometimes like stuff like that can be helpful so it kind of depends on what the overall plan is um with uh you know with london bridge there's a there's you know you guys there's can some giggle pretty monsters much, in there <laughs> you guys could do it pretty much any way you want to do it um there's you know they, they've got all the all the gear in the world to to make it make it exactly the way you want it the the question is how long it's going to take because we're only there for yeah. a couple hours yeah absolutely yeah. And the demo also is a good, like, just a reminder, you know, if you're in the studio and like a part's not feeling right, you're like, can we hear the demo? And then you realize like, oh my gosh, the drummer should be on the ride in this section rather than the crash or something, you know? Yep. Um, it's, it's good just to kind of remind you of, of what it was. Cause yeah, you go in the studio, it's a new environment. You're kind of excited and you're kind of rushed because we have two or three hours to record this song and um, there's going to be a lot going through your mind. So that's kind of another little safety net. If you already have a demo of it, you're like, okay, I know I have a copy of it that I can reference at any time. If you're, if anyone's kind of like me, I get a little bit nervous um, and anxiety when I go into, <laughs> into studios just because yeah. I want it to be great. And uh, one thing that happens to me is my brain will just completely empty. It will just, <laughs> <laughs> just everything that I think I know about the song will just immediately vanish. And, uh, you know, especially if it's a newer song, I mean, these are going to get the ones you guys go to record are going to be newer songs. They, they are either currently in their inception or, or will be soon. And we're only recording, you know, we're recording not too far from now. So, um, yeah. all that information going in really fast and then having to come out all at once, um, can be daunting. The, the demo recording, like, like Jeff was saying, can be kind of a nice fallback just to know that you have a reference of what, what the idea was. So in case you've, your brain empties like mine does you're like oh that's right it starts on a got it okay let's go yeah, yeah. you know like it's like oh yeah i used like to do little... that when i played bass in a band on the set list i'd always write down the first note of every song and that was just as long as i had the first note i knew like one two three four but i'm gonna have that note yeah. and i'm gonna the rest i'll fill in i, I have a i have a similar story i wrote i wrote out set lists for the bands for the for my one of my bands and um uh, the drummer was like, I don't, I don't really know the names of any of these songs. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So the next, the next show I brought, I brought all of the ones, all of a set list in the order of all the words I say to him to remind him what song it is. <laughs> it was like the one that goes bloop, blah, blah. <laughs> like, yeah, like exactly. the droney one. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, like exactly those, the language. Those, we, those simple yeah. cues that like remind you of things. And, and, you know, for a vocalist too, like that first word of the song, you know, if you if you think you got the lyrics when you get into a studio, you're going to be surprised how fast you forget them. And yeah. uh, just having that first word, even if, you know, even if you if you have it written down, sometimes just hearing it can like help you out and stuff, too. Totally. Um, cool. Does anyone else have any questions? I see Miles said that yes in the chat room. I oh, think maybe it's a recording at home. Did, did you have any questions, Miles? I had the chat closed. Go me. I'm a great host. <laughs> oh no <nope>. all right <laughs> he does not have any questions all right miles um i was trying to think if i have any questions but i think I don't. like his chat is yes no <laughs> let's talk about one advanced thing because i know we got some older older guys in here too um mm -hmm. and i think a few a few people interested in recording i know keegan is um what is the simplest way you can explain a compressor because I think that's one of the most basic things that basic tools you might use as a home recording artist or someone that's interested in doing that. Um, it's, you know, sort of the Swiss army knife of recording and something that you do for a lot of, a lot of different reasons. Um, what is, what is the basic way of explaining what that does? The basic way is it's a leveling amplifier. So basically like in the old school days before compressors, somebody would actually have their hand on the mic pre and then like when the singer started singing really quiet they would boost this up and keep the same and then when they got really loud they would turn it down i was trying to do it i don't I have no way of monitoring this but i was doing my game so 
basically a compressor is going to do that automatically. So you're going to set a threshold where if anything gets louder than that, it's going to push it down in level. And so the byproduct of that is that now you can turn everything up a little bit. So that means that the stuff that was quieter is now going to get louder and the stuff that was louder is now going to get quieter. So you're basically, you know, it's, it's a leveling thing. And there's, there's a couple of basic um, controls to, to every compressor and that would be the threshold. And that is basically where is the line where once the level goes above this, is it going to be smashed? So that's your threshold. The other two are attack and release. And that is basically going to be like, how quickly is it going to smash it? And then how quickly is it going to release it and let it go? JP Music Pro is on. Hey, what's up? <laughs> uh, so talking to, I'm talking to Sky Warden right here. He's, uh, do you mind if I put you on? I haven't had your camera on my stream. You look good. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Now you're on there a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. I'm like, I'm like, it's like, it's like a web of skies. <laughs> yes. Sky, sky web. There we sky go. Sky web. Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, I'll funny. turn this one off. There we go. Um, so did I answer your question about compressors? Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, you know, for anyone interested in, in, in sort of helming the uh, demo recording process for your band, um, the, you know, the software that comes built in on the laptop that you guys can use, or even any kind of system you have at home, definitely has a compressor. And I encourage you to experiment with that if you're finding it difficult to get something either loud enough or quiet enough <laughs> to, to kind of sit right, you know, and just, just, just to see what it does. Um, th that's sort of one of the first sort of uh, things you learn as you, as you adventure into recording stuff um, yeah. that, and that and EQ, but I think most people can kind of figure out EQ, you know, that's, it's not well, super in compression. I always say start on like a snare or something first because mm. voice might be harder. I mean, I could give a little demonstration if you wanted. Yeah. I don't know how much time we have. Yeah, we got all the time. If people get bored, they can leave. <laughs> <laughs> they can just tune out. Yeah. Jonathan, we were just talking about you uh, when you recorded Sky's Band a while ago. <laughs> when was that? Oh, that was uh, uh, 2013 the first time, 14 the first time. No, 15. Wow. 2015. I think, again, it was like... 2000 no, no no 2014 2015 i think it was like those two years something like that okay a while ago that was a while ago so yeah i use studio one just like uh, everyone else will be using i believe yep right? that's what that's what's loaded on the uh the laptop is the same software uh Jeff oh amadon amadon yeah yeah it says amadon <laughs> rules nice um Let's see. I'll just bring a snare in from somewhere. Let's see. Where can I find a snare track? I'm sure I got a million of them anywhere. But it's it's a really good way to hear the difference, or to hear the, the attack and release. Mm. It says he misses you, brother. I miss you too, John. I we'll have to get a we'll have to get a beer after all this is uh, behind us. <laughs> Is it ever going to be all behind us? Well, maybe, I mean, eventually. I this too so. shall pass, as they say. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see. What am I looking for? I'm looking for Studio One. Okay, I'll find this, see? This is live. <laughs> okay, chill out, Jeff. Chill out. Okay, you got it. <laughs> Media. There's a loop. I wonder what this is. Oh, okay, that'll work. That's craziness. So everything about personas is just drag and drop except for this for some reason. Oh. What's going on? Oh, I think there's something I got. There you go. I had a window open. So you just drag it, boom, put it at the beginning. Actually, um, this isn't the beginning. Let's see, okay. So here we got something. 
This is our drum beat. Put it in loop mode. Yeah, am I a good programmer or what? Come on. <laughs> no. No? <laughs> it seems to be coming through fairly quiet. Is it? I just yeah. turned it down. Okay, let's see if we go. Oh, no, it's not going at all. Yeah, I'm not Let me get it. to, uh, everybody has to go to their in-out setup. That's where you will choose that lovely interface that, that you all got, <laughs> which I need to go out and do uh, this guy. There you go. You got it? Mm, nope. Really? No. No. Oh, here we go. You got it now? Nope. Oh, you know, I don't have the audio routed right, so you guys aren't going to hear it. You have to. You have to go listen to Twitch. <laughs> Wait. Oh yeah. Here. Where's my Zoom? Well, you route it from there. That's not a bad idea. Oh, that's weird. It should be. Oh no. Okay, up here. Where is it? I should. There we go. Now we hear it. I just beat Mario 2 while we were talking. <laughs> nice. The only problem is I can't like talk and play this at the same time. So I got that up. So what I, what I'll the do other, is the I'll, other, uh, real quick, Jeff, you might want to, uh, if you haven't already, uh, turn off noise cancellation on your zoom because it likes, oh, to yeah. it likes to suppress things like beats. Jonathan, you can hear it. Yeah. It's going to the stream. It wasn't going to my zoom. I think so. Um, let's see, where's that at? Uh, I think it's under advanced. Audio? Oh, down here. None? Disable? Yep. yep. Disable? Auto, I guess. Is that any better? Well, I guess you're uh, not hearing it. Not hearing okay, it. Okay, so I'll put sure a compressor. We'll okay. <laughs> I'll put a compressor on it, and I'll just start with it. Fast attack. And what you'll hear is um, that it will get longer the sound will actually get longer. And then I'll go a slow attack and quick release and you'll hear how it gets shorter. Cool. Switch over here. That was kind of, I think there's too much happening. Maybe, maybe you can kind of hear it, but. Um, I, I could kind of pick up on it. I'll, I'll kind of break it down a little bit. Um, so I think. I could from, hear it. From I what we were hearing, if you guys noticed, um, you know, as he turned the uh, plugin on and off, um, you notice some of the details of sort of like the underside of the drum beat kind of start to come through a little bit. And that's, you know, kind of a large portion, portion of, portion? Portion of what, <laughs> what compression is, is, is helping you kind of get that, um, sort of presence of something without having to like just crank it to all craziness to, to hear those details. 
and also like this is program drum so everything's like exact same velocity but if you think about a a drummer maybe not every snare hit is exactly the same so this can help even that out and also with the singer you know from the verse to the chorus there's going to be probably a, a real big dynamic range that you might not want that much in the recording and even you know in singing words you know sometimes like uh the sort of uh there's a certain point where the singer might get soft enough to where it kind of just flies underneath the rest of the music and you don't really hear those words and then you know one word kind of gets a little bit loud and you hear that fully fully present and fully loud and that's when yeah. when compression is is your best friend for situations like that just to kind of like let the singers quieter stuff sit on top of the music still but not those loud notes go absolutely into the rafters crazy loud you kind of mm -hmm. limit you limit the range of how loud something gets how quiet something gets and how loud something gets um and for things like that it can be really helpful all right well i think we've covered quite a totally. bit um and jeff i thank you so much for your time and your expertise and your uh oh yeah uh, soft-spoken information <laughs> <laughs> well wait till we get in the studio i'll start yelling great awesome and uh i can't wait to see you in in the studio in uh i think what like a month from now or something like that oh sully a little... what's up hey sully finally joined oh, and autumn <laughs> <laughs> it was pg 17 <laughs> all right brother well we'll talk to you soon um thank you guys for joining um uh th yeah thank you i guess I I thank you so much and i look forward to seeing everybody uh in just a couple of weeks in the studio yes so get those it's gonna songs, be a lot of fun get those songs written if you need to borrow the uh studio uh, the demo recording uh gear yeah. that i have let me know um I, I unfortunately only have one pack so it's gonna have to get passed around a little bit um, but that's okay. We can make that happen. So uh, yeah, and like you, you know, use the iPhones. Use what you have, because the main thing is, you know, you're going to be able to go into London Bridge. So don't really worry about the recording too much. Worry about the song and making sure that everybody knows knows what they should be playing and when they should be playing it. And Absolutely. And you'll yeah. be able to get the most use out of your studio time. Yeah, that is the absolute first priority. Get the song as you know, just squared out as much as you can. Just get all the pieces put together. Get all take a listen to it on a bunch of iPhone recordings before you even, you know, think about trying to do the, the, you know, the demo recording stuff so that you know what you're doing as you do that part too. And then you just kind of build on it from there. You go one yeah. step at a time, just, just getting all the, all the uh, pieces put in place. And then that, that's what ends up becoming a great recording. Totally. All right. If anybody has any questions, you know, as you're going through this process, feel free to reach out to me and at Ot music on just about every platform. You can follow me on Twitch, Instagram, anywhere ott music if you want to send me a uh, scribbling of those i will put that on the website from the on the member site so that people can get a hold of you cool all right well, sounds thank you great so, thank you so much guys we'll talk to you soon all right have bye. a great night bye <laughs>